<laughs> oh my gosh, this is broken. Oh my gosh. <laughs> For real, what's the problem? All right, this is it. Nope. Hey, happy anniversary, Restoration Church. We are so glad that you have tuned in today. Thank you for joining us for Restoration Church Online on this very special Sunday. My name is Kurt. I'm one of the pastors here. And as we kick off the message, we are excited that you are here partying with us. And, and I just wanted to say, it's unbelievable what God has done over this last year. And I just want to give a special shout out to our staff and our elders and all of our servant leaders just for the incredible, incredible job that you have done as we've pivoted as we've gone through pandemic together. Not only did we relaunch as a church, but then we had to reinvent how we're doing everything. And so we just want to celebrate all that God has done over this last year today. And thank you for joining us. Uh, we are wrapping up a series that we started a couple weeks ago called Worst Year, Best You. How do we become the best version of ourselves even after a really, really challenging year of 2020? And so if you've missed any of the previous conversations in this series, I would encourage you to check them out on our YouTube page. But today we're talking about how do we be intentionally investing in the things of God? How do we we see our resources, our time, our energy, our money, the way God sees it so that we actually want to do the things that he asks us to do. So I'm so glad that you're here. When I was in high school, I was a coach for our community club's swim team. And we had about six weeks of practice before our first swim meet at the beginning of the summer. And I remember there was this one time, there was a seven-year-old that I was coaching and he was new to the area and new to our team, but he was really good. And I was talking with him after warm-up at our first swim meet. So he showed up on Saturday morning and we're, you know, warming up and we're getting done with our practice and we're doing this little team huddle. And I, I asked him, hey, how are you feeling with your first swim meet? And I want you to go out there and just do great. I want you to give it your best. You can actually win your race. And his eyes got really big, kind of nervous. And he said, it's a race? I thought we were just here to meet people. It's called a swim meet, not a swim race. And in that moment with that seven-year-old, I was kind of like, I don't know what to say. I mean, you're not wrong. And bonus, right? I felt really great about myself as a coach. Like I've really set this young star up to succeed today. <laughs> right? But here's what we're talking about today is you've had moments like that where, you know, we are going to have these conversations that something is going to shift in your brain and it might not be what you thought it was. Every once in a while, you have one of these kind of aha moments where suddenly something about your world causes you to see it differently, whether it's a relationship or something related to your job or in school or whatever it might be. And in that moment, even though nothing actually changes, your perspective changes in such a profound way that you really begin to see the world and see yourself differently and, and, and maybe even different than perhaps the way you were taught to see it. And this is why it's so central to this idea of Christianity, this idea that the Apostle Paul references called the renewing of your mind, right? The renewing of your mind. And he, he's talking about this idea that actually our way of seeing the world, we have to learn to see the world in a different way. We have to actually learn to see the world the way God sees the world. And that way, when you hear God ask you to do something, it actually will make a whole lot more sense because you see it his way. That when you see the way that God created relationships or marriage or money or learning how you see your professional life from God's perspective, learning how you see yourself, your potential, your opportunities. When we learn to see the world the way that God intended for it to be, when he asks us to do something, it actually makes more sense. When we see the way God sees, we will actually be more inclined to do what God says because what he invites us to do doesn't become a burden anymore, but rather it's actually a invitation to something that feels like the better way. It's like, oh, of course I would do it that way because we have this renewed sense of how we see the world. That as we read the scriptures or engage in our spirituality, it's no longer a, a list or a bunch of commands, but actually the way of Jesus becomes the better option, the wisest choice, what's actually what you would want to do, right? And that's because God isn't interested in behavior modification, right? That's religion. God is interested in your heart transformation. And that is what happens when you begin to love and follow Jesus. And in fact, one of the most, you know, simple, but actually life-changing prayers that you and I could pray is simply, help me see as you see, so I'll do as you say. Help me, God, to see as you see, so that I can do as you say. 
And so here's what we're going to talk about today, and here's where it really gets interesting. One day, Jesus is teaching, and he looks around kind of his followers, around the crowd and the audience, and, and he has this moment where he realizes he needs to teach them how God sees these people, right? There were sinners there, tax gatherers, religious elites, all kinds of people. And he looks at them, and he says, hey, I'm going to teach them how to see one another. This is so important. And so on that particular afternoon, he chooses to tell them three different stories, parables. And in this trilogy of parables, he always has the same refrain over and over again. He talked about the story of a lost sheep. And maybe you remember that story, right? He talked about a shepherd who had a hundred sheep and one got away and he went after that one. He tells a story of a lost coin where a woman had lost something extremely valuable, more valuable than we can really comprehend when we hear the word coin, but she had lost one of them and she spent all day looking for it. When she finds it, she celebrates with her neighbors. Then he tells a story of a lost son, a father who couldn't wait for his son to return. And as Jesus teaches the group, he is teaching them, this is how God views people who are disconnected from him. He doesn't write them off. They're actually that important to him that he would spend time looking for them. And as these people around Jesus are, are, are turning to leave, many perhaps rolling their eyes, Jesus isn't finished. And he wants to teach them one more lesson about how God sees their role in the world. If that's how God sees the, all these people, what's our role? What's our part to play in it? And so if you've ever wondered what Jesus thinks is the most important role that you and I can play in this mission of God, this story is for us too. But instead of saying, hey, hey, before you leave, I got one more for you. Jesus does what Jesus does because he is the master communicator. And he simply says out loud, loud enough for all of them to hear kind of in their peripheral vision as they're turning away. Oh, and there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. Right, he, he, he had them, right? He had that hook in their hearts. They turned back around and the trailer got them interested in the rest of the story because many of them probably were rich people who didn't really know how their household was being managed, perhaps by a slave who was over their household resources. And so as they turn around, right, they listen, they lean in. They want to know, what is this story going to teach me about how to keep track of who's doing what and who has what and what things were going on in their own home? And so Jesus looks at the crowd, but in his gaze, in his peripheral vision, he sees the religious leaders watching and listening and maybe leaning in as well. So here's how it goes. Jesus tells this story about a rich man whose money manager was accused of wasting his possessions. And so he calls him in and he says, you can't be my manager any longer. He says, I've heard what you've been doing. You've kind of been a little shady with my, my resources. It's been irresponsible, too many loose ends. You're fired, right? He, he just kind of lets the guy go. And he says, here's what I need you to do. I need you to wrap up all the books. You know, you have a couple of days, pull them together. I want you to bring me all the accounts, but then you're done. And so this money manager is, you know, realizing hey, this is not going well for him, right? But he has a couple more days to kind of wrap this up before he loses his job. And as Jesus continues to tell the story, he says, the money manager went to all of the people, right? All the people who owed his boss money. And he says, I am not strong enough to dig ditches and I'm too ashamed to beg. I need to use these three days wisely to help set myself up for the future. And so in the parable, the money manager calls all these people in. He has a little bit of time and he says, hey, what do you owe my boss? Oh, you owe a thousand bushels a week. Great. Let's make it 800. We'll call it even. Oh, you owe him you know, a dozen oxen. Let's just go with 10. And, and can you do that? Cool. You can do that now. Let's, let's just call it even. You're good. And all of these people that owed a significant amount of resources to his boss are wondering why they're getting a discount. Was it the State Farm Connection? I don't know what it was, right? They're just coming in and they're like, this is a really good day. I don't know what got you know, into the money manager, but I'm excited. And we have to realize that as Jesus is telling the story, he is painting a picture of this money manager's plan that I want you to pay attention to, right? The money manager says, I know what I'll do, that's today, so that when I lose my job, which is shortly coming, that's tomorrow, then these people will, that's a future plan, right, will welcome me into their homes. Because he says, hey, you know, you got it, no problem. You can have a discount. Wow, thank you so much. If there's ever anything I can do for you, man, he goes, great, count on it. It might be coming sooner than you think, right? And, and so here's what's important is Jesus is telling the story. This money manager had a plan. Whether it was good or not, whether it was honest or not, that's not really the point. 
The point is he had a plan. And here's what I want us to understand as we talk about our own resources today, is that actually everyone else has a plan for your money. But do you? Everyone around you has a plan for your resources. Netflix has a plan for your resources. That's why they're raising you know, their dues, right? Your credit card company, your bank, people that you work for all have a plan for your money. Do you? If we're honest, most of us don't. And so in this moment, this you know, money manager invites all these people in and makes a deal because he is planning for the future. Life didn't go his way, he's about to lose his job, but he takes advantage of the time that he has. And then to the religious leaders and probably all the people in the crowd's dismay, they are waiting for Jesus to drop the hammer on this guy and that this would be a bad situation. But he wraps up the parable by saying, and then his manager right? His boss, the rich man, brings this dishonest manager to him and says, well done. And everybody's aghast, right? They, they walk away speechless because they did not expect that from Jesus. And, and you might even be thinking, if you've never heard this story before, seriously, is that like something Jesus actually said? And seriously, it is. Look it up. It's in the gospel of Luke. And so when he says the master, the rich guy, commended the dishonest manager People were very, very surprised. But Jesus wants to illustrate a point. He was commended because he had a plan, right? He was commended because he knew that life wasn't going his way. He was about to lose his job. And he decided to take the time that he had to prepare for the future. He had a little bit of time and a little bit of opportunity, and he invested it intentionally. And, and all the people in Jesus' audience, maybe like you, if you've never heard this parable before, they were dumbfounded, right? It was just quiet on the street. And Jesus was like, yeah, I want you, your heavenly father wants you to use what you have in such a way that you actually plan not only for the future, but that you actually bless other people with what you have. I mean, I mean, this is amazing, right? That God sees your life, your time, your talents, and yes, even your money and possessions as a tool. I don't know if anyone's ever told you that. But God actually sees your money as a tool. And so we ask the question all the time, what will I have to show for it? What will I have to show for it? And, and that's a good question. But Jesus wants us to ask a better question. Who will you have to show for it? Whose life will be better, will be impacted, will be changed because you used your money as a tool? So as they're walking away, his, his followers that are kind of close to him, you know, they, they weren't really clear on what Jesus was trying to say. And so they asked him, hey, explain it to us, as they often did after Jesus told one of these stories. And so in Luke 16, 10, it'll be up on the screen, you can follow along. He explains to them the kind of moral of this story. And Jesus says, if you are faithful in the little things, you will be made faithful in the large things. But if you're dishonest in the little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. Just like this dishonest manager was dishonest before, he was going to be dishonest again. It says, if you're untrustworthy about worldly wealth, what you have been given to manage, why would anyone trust you with the riches of heaven? And if you're not faithful with other people's things, why should you be trusted that you could have things of your own? I mean, this is lessons that we teach our kids, right? Right but he's talking about how we view our stuff compared to how God views it. He goes on to say, no one can serve two masters. You will either love one and hate the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise or discount the other. And then he brings it home. He says, no one can serve God and be enslaved to their money. I mean, this is powerful language. What Jesus wants us to understand, what he wants his disciples there in the moment, I think he wants you and me to understand is that we've all been given just a little bit. A little bit of time, a little bit of resource, a little bit of opportunity. And it's not even really ours. It's, it's a gift for us to manage because we all leave it here. Now, you might look around and, and think, well, I got a little bit and they got a lot bit. And, oh, they really have a little bit. But from heaven's perspective, everybody has a little bit. Nobody's really got much and it all kind of looks the same. And this is what Jesus wants you to understand. That how your heavenly father views your stuff and our money is how he invites us to see it as well. And I know that this can get uncomfortable for some people, but, but this is why this is important, right? I want you to get this. This isn't about shame or blame. You know, God's not into that, but God knows that the chief competitor for your heart is your money. It's, it's your stuff. And it's the security or the anxiety that comes with it. I mean, think about just the last week and the conversations that you've had, the ones that have stressed you out, 
Probably they were about money or the economy or what that money can buy. When you find yourself you know, feeling secure, it's really because maybe you feel stronger at the beginning of the month because your bank account looks good. But when those double digit days come at the end of the month, it feels a little tight, right? And this is what Jesus says is actually how you view your money and wealth says a lot about your heart. It's not even about the stuff. It's about what it is that you are relying on and trusting in and depending on. Jesus says, actually, your resources is not just something that you manage. It's actually a reflection. It's an indicator of whose you truly are. Now, look, I've been, I've been doing this for a long time. I've been a, a Christian following Jesus for a long time. And I've had my own struggles in this area, just like everybody else. But, but here's what I absolutely know for a fact. Generosity is actually not even a financial issue. Right? Generosity has virtually nothing to do with the amount of money that you make. Generosity has everything to do with your heart. And here's how I know that. There are rich people who are not generous. There are people that have extra that hoard it for themselves. And then there are people that seem to have hardly anything at all who are extraordinarily generous, not just in percentage, but in actual dollars amounts, right? I mean, and you probably know people like that as well. There, you know people who are generous and they may not be the richest people that you know, right? So generosity is not a financial issue. It is a heart issue. Right? There are people on every level of the spectrum, people that don't have much, people that have way too much, and a lot of us kind of right in the middle. But Jesus invites all of us to decide to be generous. And this is what we're talking about today, because when we look to this parable that Jesus is telling us, and, and the moral he's trying to lift out of it, is that for many of us, we really don't have an issue with the idea of being generous. Right? We, we don't have an, an issue with, with wanting to, we just don't have a plan to get there. The Apostle Paul echoes this idea, right, to a young leader in 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 18. And he encourages him to teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable, but to put their trust in God who richly gives us all that we need for our enjoyment. Do you hear the word play there? Don't trust in your riches, but trust in the one who richly provides all the things you have in your life. He goes on and says, use your money to do good. Right? Money's not a bad thing. Right? It says, use it. It's a tool. Use it to do good. And to be generous to those in need, always ready to share with others. So here's the point, right? Here's the way that God sees your wealth, your money, your possessions, everything that comes your way, as much or as little as you feel you have. He feels that you have been given an opportunity, a little bit of time and a little bit of resource. And, and you have this opportunity to use your money, to use your possessions. I have an opportunity to use all of my money and all of my possessions as a tool to bring about the things that he cares most about. And your heavenly father and mine is watching to see how much of this you are willing and how much of this I am willing to turn into some form that helps other people. Because from eternity's perspective, we all have a little bit to share and God says, when you do that, when you actually you know, partner with me and what I'm doing around the world, we can make a big difference together. So whether 2020 was a great year for you financially, or perhaps if you're honest, it was the toughest year of your life. Whether you got a new job or a promotion or whether you lost your job, no matter what this last chapter of your life was like, you can actually begin to write a new story today is what it looks like for you to be generous. And, and better yet, right? Even out of the worst year, you have the opportunity, if you're willing, to take a step to become the best you. But it requires that you take radical responsibility for your life, just like we talked about last week. It requires that you and I take an honest look and take radical responsibility for our finances. Right? Because if you are honest with yourself, and I'm honest with myself, we have to have a plan to do this. Just wanting, just wishing that we would, not going to get us there. And so ask yourself right now, do you have a plan? At, at the end of the month, do you know where your money went? Or at the end of the month, do you go, where did all the money go? <laughs> right? And so here's what I want to do. I want to teach you over these last few moments we have together a principle that I've learned a long time ago that has been so helpful for me. And it comes right out of this passage. So the smartest people that I know take this to heart and they manage their money according to this principle. They've actually allowed the Holy Spirit of God to help them see the way God sees so that doing what God says when it comes to their finances, it actually makes sense to them. It's actually the better way. And I'm going to be honest with you. This plan is so simple. 
and it's scalable, right? It's so important that it's scalable. It works whether you have a lot or whether you have a little. It works whether you're a kid with an allowance or a CEO earning six figures with a bonus account, right? You can use this plan in your own finances. You can use this with your company. We've used this in our family since we've been married and it has saved us from the most challenging financial seasons we've walked through, right? If you build this into your life, whether it's you know, as a kid and a teenager or it's never too late to start, this will benefit you, okay? Now, I know perhaps you're tuning in and you're joining us for our anniversary, which I'm so excited that you are, but maybe you're not a Christian or you tuned into church because somebody invited you. And I wanna tell you, don't back up from this, right? This could actually revolutionize your life, right? There's all kinds of people trying to sell you financial wisdom. You can actually put this into practice and it will work for you and you don't even have to pay for it, right? So this plan is super simple, but we call it the 10, 10, 80 plan. Now you don't have to you know, worry about that for right now because you're gonna pick your own numbers, but really it's this idea that there is three categories that you want to invest in intentionally today, tomorrow, and eternity. So I have 20 packets of Skittles right here. So let's say that this represents what you bring in your home financially each month, right? And so we want to give in proportion to each of these areas. And so if you wanted to give 10% to invest in eternity, right? To invest intentionally into the things of God, right? Then maybe you put two of these in there. If you want to give 5%, maybe you just do one. If you want to do, you know, two and a half percent, you can kind of open it up and pour it out and you get the idea, right? So let's just say for right now, you put one of those in there. That's an eternity. That goes first. The smartest people I know, they give to what matters way out in the future first. The second is tomorrow, right? What, what is coming that I, I can plan for, I can save for, but it's not immediate. They put the next one there, right? And this is exactly what that money manager did. He goes, I know what's coming. I need to plan for the future. And then if you do that, you put eternity first and then tomorrow, you get to take the rest and you put it in today and you get to live off of this, right? You get to do what you want to do. You do you, boo, right? This is what the plan means. But when you do this, imagine just for a second that this was how you intentionally invested your resources, your little bit of time and your little bit of money in your life. Imagine if each month you did this, you gave, you were generous, you saved, you saved for tomorrow and then you lived off the rest. Now, again, I know that this might feel so counterintuitive to everything you've thought. You're thinking, I can barely get through today on what I make. How can I do this? But believe me, think back to you know, last year, you. If you had been doing this last year, wouldn't this year have been easier? My, my guess is the answer is yes. I know that would have been true for me. If last year I said, you know, I can go without that Starbucks latte. I can go without, you know, that new thing, or I can go without the upgrade to the house and I can put it away so that when life comes my way in a way I do not expect, I have something to pull from, right? If you and I, if we do this, this will benefit your life. And I know this, not just from scripture, but from my own story. There's been so many times when I've wanted to take out of here. I've wanted to take out of here because of what was going on here. But when I have chosen not to, and I've stuck to this plan, I'm always grateful for it later. Because here's what I know about you, right? You're never going to get to the end of your life, the end of your story, and wish that you had been less generous and more selfish. You're never going to get to the end of your life or the end of your story and wish that you had spent more rather than prepared for the future. You're never going to get to a hard spot financially and wish you had gotten that upgrade back then. All of us know that this works, but it's so difficult to work this plan sometimes. But when we choose to do it, it benefits you. And so this is the principle. This is how you can actually become the best you even after the worst year is by intentionally investing first in eternity, in things that matter, things that are beyond you, and then into tomorrow, things that are not yet here, but that you know are coming to put something away, to save, to invest in your future, and then the rest you can live on. So when we do this, right, when we live in this way where we are investing in eternity, right, we're saving for tomorrow and then we live on the rest today, it actually enables us to enjoy and experience freedom in our finances. The number one cause of stress, my guess, in your life, certainly in America, is financial stress. And so if you want to become the best you, you got to work this plan. 
maybe you have a plan. If you do and it's working, stick with it. But most of us, we, we don't have a plan, right? So work this plan, try it out, see what happens. So here's the next step for you, right? Starting in February, this next month, I know that's tomorrow, right? Take what you have coming in and pick a percentage and just stick to it. If it's two, if it's five, if you want to start at 10, whatever it is, stick to it and give and, and save and live off of those percentages. Now in February, the today jar is going to require the least, right? So it's actually the easiest month for you to start. Some of you are just getting that, right? Shortest month of the year. Uh, you got it, right? There it is. So start it, try it this month and see if you don't feel more financially free at the end of it even if it takes a little bit of sacrifice along the way. Because here's what I know about you. Whether you believe the Bible or not, whether you're a church person or not, you want to be an intentional investor of the opportunity that you have. You want to take the time and the resources and, and, the, and the energy that you have here in your life, and you want to make the most of it. I don't think you'd be watching this if you didn't. And especially as we celebrate our anniversary as Restoration Church today, like you got to know that this church was built off of people's sacrifice, people that choose to live this plan with their resources, choosing to see eternity as valuable, which means they saw you as valuable. They saw their life and their money as a tool to benefit and serve others. And you've been the recipient of that. And so I know you don't, you don't want to be known as stingy or consumeristic. You want to be generous. You want to be the best you. And one of the best ways to do that is to invest intentionally. Because as Jesus says, ultimately, it not only says a lot about who you are, but it's an indicator of whose you are. So here's my challenge for you today, right? It's just to, to take that test, to, to realize that your money is a tool and that God wants you to use it so that you don't have financial regrets because you chose to set aside a percentage to give it to eternity, to invest in the things of God, to save it for tomorrow, and then you lived off the rest because this is how you and I will be able to use it well, not just our resources, but our opportunity when we invest intentionally. So let me pray for you as we wrap up. Heavenly Father, thank you that all that we have is actually a gift from you. And on this anniversary of our church, I'm just so humbled by how so many people have invested in the things of you. that they've, they've given sacrificially, they've served, they've, they've shown up, they've invited friends to build your church. And I know that for so many of us, especially after such a challenging year financially, many of us are, are wondering, where, where do we go from here? How do we make sure that we can become the best version of ourselves even after such a difficult season. So I pray that this plan would bring freedom to people's hearts and their lives. I pray that, that their marriages would get better because the finances would be in order. I pray that they would be better parents and better bosses and better employees because they worked this plan. And thank you, Jesus, that you use ordinary people, not only just in your story, that you use a story about someone that we might you know, write off to teach us an important lesson, but you use us, everyday ordinary men and women and children to build your church and to do something powerful through us. We're so grateful for who you are and for what you're doing here at Restoration Church. And I pray that as we intentionally invest in the things of you, that you would actually do an incredible work of transformation in our hearts. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are and for how you're leading us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you so much for being with us today as we celebrated our anniversary. What an extraordinarily special day for us, and we're so glad that you were here. I would encourage you, before we wrap up with a closing song, we have an opportunity to actually worship God by putting into practice what we just talked about. I know, you're shocked, but we're actually going to have an opportunity for us to receive an offering and to give back generously to God, who has given everything that we have to us to manage. And so if you want to celebrate this anniversary with us through your financial giving, you you can do that three different ways. You can go to restorationchurchsd.com slash give to set up one time or reoccurring giving. It's actually the safest and most secure way for you to do it. It's how my family and I choose to give. We have loved giving the opportunity to invest generously into what God is doing here because we love seeing lives 
transformed and, and people come to know who Jesus is through Restoration Church, just like you. And so you can give that way. You can grab your cell phone if it's near you and text any amount in the message and send it to the number 84321. You'll get a text prompt back. You can click on that and, and follow that link to set up Restoration Church as your giving destination. Or you can mail a check here to our building in San Diego. But however it is that you choose to give, we just wanna thank you for your generosity. Thank you for being the kind of church that lives beyond itself. Let's step into that even more this new year together.